everyone. Welcome to UBS Trending. I'm Anthony Pastore. LGBTQ Pride takes place every June, and it's a time to honor the 1969 Stonewall Uprising in Manhattan, which was the tipping point for the gay liberation movement in the United States. Today, the community has certainly come a long way, and we celebrate that here at UBS. And for today's conversation, we're going to be discussing a new white paper report on planning for the LGBTQ family. I'm joined today by three of my colleagues from the UBS advanced planning team, Brad Dillon, Casey Verse, and Joanna Morrison. So nice to have you all join us on the show and happy pride to all of you. Brad, let me ask you just to get us started. Uh, you're, you've been a frequent guest of ours here on the show and talked about all different kinds of topics. This one uh, is really different and something to celebrate, but what can readers expect from this LGBTQ planning white paper that you're all writing? Well, thank you for uh, having me on the show today, Anthony, and thanks for everyone who's tuning in. Happy Pride. Casey, Joanna, and I have all, we, we've worked with a number of LGBTQ clients here at UBS or clients with family in the LGBTQ community. So all of us really wanted to just come together for Pride Month and put together our collective experience on these particular issues. We've spoken on panels, at conferences, and like I said, the work with clients over many years. So we wanted to tackle all of the issues that we can think of when it comes to planning. And that's a very broad term, but first, the white paper really is just trying to help formulate a calculus around answering this question, this particular question, now that we can get married, well, since 2015, now that we can get married, should we get married? And then if we choose to remain unmarried, which we'll find out many, many LGBTQ couples do, what are some of the things that we should put in place to protect ourselves, to protect our family in the event, uh, either during our life, during incapacity or at death, to make sure that our wishes are really fully adhered to? And finally, what are the considerations for when an LGBTQ individual or couple uh, chooses to have children? Uh, there are a lot of interesting uh, complexities around that, that topic. So we just really wanted to come together, bring our collective experience, and answer all of those questions really as fully as we can. Yeah, thanks, Brad. It's a good way to start. And, and look, just by naming the couple of things that you did there, it is clear that planning specifically for individuals in the LGBTQ community, it's a unique experience. So maybe you could tap into a little more of that. Yep. Yep. No, it's great. It's, it's such a great question because prior to the uh, Supreme Court ruling, the Obergefell v. Hodges ruling in 2015, which made uh, same-sex marriage the law of the land, the landscape for LGBTQ planning was incredibly complex because of some states allowed it, some states didn't, federal provided some benefits, but not all benefits. And so it was a very complex la landscape, but the Obergefell ruling really simplified the landscape. However, um, it, it didn't completely simplify it. And one of the statistics that really rings true and comes out for why this is such a unique issue is that when you look at you know the number of couples uh, who have decided to marry since the Obergefell ruling has nearly doubled, but not everyone's rushing to the altar it turns out. When you look at the statistics, there are estimated to be about 1 million cohabitating LGBTQ couples in the United States. Of those approximately 1 million or so, only about half are married and the other half are unmarried. That's compared, by the way, with 90% of cohabitating heterosexual couples who are married and 10% who are unmarried. So that statistical difference is incredibly meaningful when it comes to planning for the LGBTQ community. And I think when you try to suss out that statistic and where it comes from, I think it's because a lot of us in the LGBTQ community weren't raised, at least in my generation or the generations who came before me, weren't raised believing we'd ever be able to get married for love or for any other reason. And so now that suddenly it's on the table as an option, it's become just that, an option. It's not a necessary next step as it might be for some of our heterosexual counterparts, but it's an optional next step. And because of that optionality, we're asking this really important question, now that we can get married, should we get married? And we're thinking about less from a personal standpoint, perhaps, and more objectively around what are the financial benefits of marriage? What are the income tax benefits of marriage? And by the way, what are the drawbacks of marriage? There are a lot of benefits. There are a lot of drawbacks. The benefits are numerous. We outlined those in the white paper. There are a couple of really big drawbacks as well for certain kinds of couples. But so really, it's a facts and circumstances test. Not every couple is going to look at the benefits and say they outweigh 
outweigh the drawbacks necessarily. And so that's part of what this white paper is trying to suss out. That's part of what we do in the advanced planning group is help couples in their particular situations try to figure out, is marriage an economical benefit or a drawback for you? And that's one of the things this paper does. Yeah, thank you, Brad. I, I love that, that you all got together and wrote this report for the exact reasons that you're describing, because there are so many protections that come with marriage, that legal entity of marriage, uh, that if you're not married, whether you're in a heterosexual couple or, of course, in this case, many uh, same-sex couples, you're not as, as necessarily getting. So how do you do that on your own? So it's a perfect segue. So, Joanna, something that Brad mentioned, and by the way, welcome to UBS Trending. Um, a lot of couples are considering starting families, whether they're married or they're not. So what's something that they need to be thinking about before they make that decision? Thank you so much for having me, and happy Pride Month to everyone. Um, you're absolutely right. So LGBTQ individuals and same-sex couples, they might decide to start a family in a number of different ways. And what we're seeing is that the parent-child relationship is really a state law concept. And the states, many states, have not kept up with the times since the 2015 Supreme Court decision. Um, Two very common ways for uh, people to decide to start a family would be uh, adoption or through assisted reproductive technology, um, commonly referred to as ART. Um, with adoption, you'll see that married couples uniformly can adopt jointly. In many states, that's not the case with an unmarried couple. And so you'll see you know, a lot of the things that you would think you want with a parent-child relationship um, just won't be able to happen. So obviously there, there's an emotional aspect, but we're talking about the legal aspect as well. So being able to make medical decisions for your child, um, being able to make educational decisions for your child. You would not be considered uh, the legal parent um, when only one partner in the relationship is allowed to adopt. Now, some states have something called a second parent adoption, um, but all states don't. So it's really important when you're considering where um, you're going to adopt the child to see what the state law is. Um, in regards to assisted reproductive technology, again, with, with married uh, couples, the law is usually um, the mother, the birth mother of the child will be considered a legal parent. And then the husband of the mother will be considered the other legal parent. Again, the, the law is dated and it's not keeping up with the times. And that's what you see in many states. And with a uh, married couple, uh, in 2017, the Supreme Court said uh, LGBTQ people, um, they need to also be listed on the birth certificate. You can't just say the word husband and, and exclude people. Uh, with unmarried couples, however, if only one parent, the birth mother in, in this situation I'm telling you about, can be listed on the birth certificate, then you're leaving out the other partner. And there are several cases out there where down the line, this causes real problems with custody battles and other, the same legal things that I was telling you about earlier regarding um, making decisions for the child with education or, or medical decisions. Terrific, Joanna. Yes. And, and again, this is why reading the white paper here is so incredibly important for anyone who's considering, obviously, you know, having a child, whatever method they go, uh, whatever route they go, as you mentioned. So uh, really good stuff. And, and Casey, let me bring you in here uh, for especially, uh, you know, when you're thinking about, obviously, when you're having a child, you're also thinking about financial plans and estate planning. Are there any tips specifically surrounding estate planning for same sex couples? Yes, yeah, so, uh, thank you for having us all. And yeah, happy pride to everyone out there. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, I want to tie it back to a little bit of what Brad said. I mean, first of all, planning for everybody, um, having an estate plan in place is going to be really important regardless, right? I mean, it, one of the basic tenets of an estate plan is not even just for the tax planning component, but to make sure that whoever you want to leave your wealth to when you pass away, that you've actually listed your beneficiaries in an estate planning document, right? In a will or in a revocable trust, for example. Um, so that's going to be very important for everybody, but especially for same-sex couples, I think, again, what Brad mentioned in the statistics earlier, that there is a significant, you know, more amount of uh, same-sex couples that are cohabitating and that are not legally married. And it becomes even more important for those couples to make sure that they have an estate plan in place because there are a lot of default 
inheritance laws in most states that provide for a, a default inheritance for a spouse, but wouldn't obviously provide that for an unmarried partner. Uh, and you would you know, assume in most cases that um, there are partners that have been together for a long time and been living together and would want their wealth to pass to their partner to continue to support them during their lifetime. So having an estate plan in place to be able to provide for that is very important. Um, but even outside of an inheritance context, um, really what often becomes most important is having a healthcare directive and a power of attorney in place for making financial decisions. Um, because again, state law typically provides that there are default rights for a spouse to be able to make medical decisions for a spouse if they're incapacitated. But if you're an unmarried uh, couple, those uh, rights are not given to you a lot of times by state law. And there's potential that if, you're, if your partner is incapacitated in the hospital and um, you, know, you wanted to help make medical decisions for them, that the doctor might instead take direction from another family member, right? From your partner's parent or sibling or somebody else because you know, that's really what their you know, default is. So having a healthcare directive and power of attorney in place to actually name your partner as the person that you authorize to make those decisions for you is really gonna be even more crucial for those couples um, that potentially have, have either remained unmarried um, or don't necessarily plan on getting married. Right, Brad, uh, Brad and, and Joanna and Casey, thank you very much. Casey, thanks for that last bit because I think there are probably a lot of couples out there who are, like you said, maybe they've been together a really long time and haven't really given much thought to the getting older process and what do we do to prepare for those types of things. And uh, it's not always the most pleasant conversation to have about what happens if one of us gets, you know, is not able to make medical decisions, but certainly something to be prepared for in this, in, in this uh this particular situation. Thank you all so much. I know we only just scratched the surface on what's in that white paper, so I encourage everyone out there to take a, take a read through. But let me again thank Brad, Joanna, Casey. Happy Pride to all of you, and thanks again for doing what you do for, for the community. Good to see all of you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Great. See you soon. And for more information, you can visit two different websites, particularly for this topic, UBS.com forward slash pride, P-R-I-D-E. And for all other UBS content, you can visit our main website at UBS.com forward slash views. And make sure to follow us on social media. We're on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Plus, check out all of our past UBS training episodes on demand. And if you have any questions about your portfolio or want to have a conversation about this entire conversation we had today, make sure to speak with a financial advisor. Until next time, I'm Anthony Pastore. Have a great day, everyone, and remember to keep your eyes on what's trending. We'll see you soon.